Hi, and welcome to another episode of Million Dollar Women video series. Today, I'm really excited to introduce Chatisa Bowman. She has traveled the world teaching business owners, CEOs. She has an incredible story, owns a castle in Italy. Uh, so much to share with you. Welcome, Chatisa. Thank you, Rachel. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to dive deep with you today. So please share with me a little bit about, yeah, tell me a bit about what you do now. Well, uh, I set up this company with my husband, Stephen, uh, in the year 2003. And the reason why we made that choice, and it was a deliberate choice because we have been working in the corporate world for over 20 years. And we have met so many leaders and so many uh, ways that people do in business that's not expansive and that's not conscious. And Steve and I would like to create a space for people in business, particularly the leader in the C-suite and in the board, to know that there are different ways of doing their business that would create different possibilities in the world. And it was courageous to make that choice because when we made that choice to set up the business, we were both working in like a senior executive on the six-figure income each. And Steve was a CEO of banking and finance and corporate treasurer. So for both of us to say, it's now a time for us to actually create something together. And we got a yes. And when we got a yes, you know, we thought, okay, we nearly 50 then. And we thought, why won't we do something that will create something more for us then. So we made that choice immediately to quit our job, both of us at the same time. How crazy was that, huh, Rachel? Wow, that's Actually amazing. away from an uh, amazing lucrative job because we saw a vision. We mm. knew that we want to be the catalyst of different possibility and we, we knew that we could do it. We had no doubt at all that we couldn't do it. So everyone kept on saying, are you too, you're too <laughs> crazy? Like, you to have an amazing job traveling the world, doing this thing. Why are you doing this? Wow. And we said, you know, I mean, everyone trying to talk us out of doing it, saying. Um, and did you think you were crazy at times? Did you kind of go question it at all? Or you just went, this is what we just need to focus? Um. If we actually listen to other people's points of view and reality, we might have not uh, started. We might still be stuck in the corporate world doing, you know, job as a corporate executive. But Steve and I just said, you know what, if we would like to be the change that we would like to see in the world, like, you know, Gandhi said, <laughs> we would have to make a choice mm. because we have a lot of experience in the corporate world and we knew that there, are, there were different possibilities that we could bring to the, the corporate executive. Then we made that choice and we did quit immediately, both of us. Uh, some wow. people said, well, we could just take turn to quit. No, if we made a deliberate choice wow. and if we trust if we totally trust that we could do it, then we would do it. Otherwise, you have the doubt set in, you know, you hear people say, you just slightly, you know. Uh, put your toe in the water. Put your toe in the water, and if it doesn't work, you step back. And then how many doubts would you have to have for you to even have that point of view that you just test out, and if it doesn't work, you don't have to do it. What kind of business would you be creating from that space? So no, we just said, mm. okay, we trust. We knew that we could do it. And we knew that it's truly possible for us to do it. So let's do it. 
And I think especially we do have to talk about a little bit the, the landscape of what's going on at the moment in the world that we, we're facing some times where people are finding it a little bit difficult. But now is the time to be able to look at what you want for your life and the opportunities that there are for yourself. So I love what you just said because now it gives people courage as well to show them that you don't have to just dip your toe in the water. You go for it. I love that. And the, for anyone who would choose to be that or choose to create that, they have to be willing to claim and acknowledge that they are the creator source of their life and their own reality. And they have to be willing to be that. Otherwise, they're going to have a lot of doubts. Otherwise, they're going to not trust that they could do it. So both Steve and I have done that before. I think I told you the story about... I want to hear it. Younger. Yes, <laughs> yes but, tell me again. I love this story. Well, when we were younger, we, you know, we both made a choice, a deliberate choice to go to U.S. to do our master degree with very tiny, um, what do you call sponsorship or What year are you talking? What year are we talking? Uh, I was 29 then, so my God, many years ago, 1980-something. So we went there and we made a choice that we could do it. I mean, we didn't even think that we couldn't do it. So when we got there, we realized that we didn't have any money, you know, and we couldn't survive for two years with wow. not much money. So we couldn't get the job because we, you know, we, we do doing our study and we, we, we can't actually go out and get the job to, to, to feed us. So we were... Uh, at the beginning, we were eating, uh, you know, a one-dollar TV dinner in America during those time. You can get one full set of tea, frozen TV dinner that got everything: brownies and and cheese and roast beef and everything all in one. So we ate that for for a few weeks. In fact, into a few months, and I said to Steve, "You know what? If we're going to live here, it doesn't work for me." I, I, we, this is not the life I would like to have. So what else could I be and do to actually help us create and generate and create different possibilities for us to be here for two years? And I, my training uh, then was in industrial design, fashion design, ergonomics and all those. So I said, you know what? I could make something. I could design something because... People were really uh, curious about Australian then. And I thought, well, if I design fashion, you know, knitwear, and I could actually take order and sell knitwear in, you know, Australiana's knitwear. And so I, I never knew how to knit. When you talk about Australiana, are you talking about the kangaroo on the jumper bottle brushes on the jumper you know three-dimensional uh kangaroo koala uh, kookaburra and all those things so so i started off like that um so we went looking for knitting machine i taught myself immediately to do the knitting wow there was no point of view that i couldn't do it because you know I don't know. I never had a point of view. I couldn't do anything. So I, I, I bought the yarn, started knitting. So I, I made about 10 samples. Then we thought, well, we could just take to New York. We live in uh, Washington, D.C., Arlington then. And we said, you know, we could just buy some train ticket, carry this into New York and show to people and see what they think. And being us, we didn't know that we couldn't do it. So we, be, we went knocking on the... Um, a buying office like Saks Fifth Avenue in New York and Bert Dorf Goodman and all of the major uh, um, department store in New York and say, hey, you know, I have some sample. We're from Australia and just wondering whether you would be interested in having a look at this. And they said, do you know that you can't just turn up at the buying office and demand <laughs> to see people, but hey, we love to see it. 
So, so, you know, okay. so we buy, I think it was just uniquely, no one ever done it. And we didn't conform to the idea that you can't do it because they said you couldn't. So every single buyer that we saw, uh, saw the thing and said, you know what, they're great, but we need agent. So one of the buyer from one department store called this agent in New York uh, of Seven Avenue and said, oh, there's these two Australian designer and have amazing, unusual things. Maybe you should see them. So we immediately carry our sample, ran over to his 7th Avenue office, saw him and he signed us up immediately. So Wow. And how many had, did you sell for your first lot? Well, the, the first lot was we immediately, he immediately got us into Dallas trade show, which is the biggest trade show in the world. I didn't know how big it was until I went there. Like you spend two wow. weeks, you can see everything. So yeah, we, we did really well, uh, you know, immediately. How did you keep up with them all? The agent did. The agent all took right. all the orders. The agent did everything. So I had to, you know, start that production because I didn't, I didn't have expectation that it's going to be that big. So Whoever came for a visit, they end up helping me making my knitwear, doing the jumper, because a lot of things are very much uh, uh, time intensive because I wanted to do, you know, embroidery and things onto that. So, yeah, so we did really well in, in New York. And so the key point is not knowing it's not possible, not knowing that you're not supposed to do anything, you could do anything. I love that. So where did your mindset come from? So did you grow up with family that were entrepreneurial? Because it sounds like you've had a really strong, like, I'm going to go get whatever I can do anything. So where did that come from? I'm glad you said that. And which just put me into a different mindset because, look, my father, you know, the idea about money, I think one question you asked me about money and I went into, oh, I wonder what that was. But my father was... Um, what would you call a real risk taker entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. And I used to have many points of view about him that he so risk taker that he would not think of the consequences okay. that he would do to the family, to anything by willing to just throw everything into the, you know, in the space and hope something will stick. And sometime, he did super well and he was really, really good. Like one of the questions you did ask me, did I come, did I grow up with money? Yeah, on the good days, he's make a lot of money. But because he, he did not make a conscious choice all the time, he just made choice from the space of, I want to make money. I want to make money. I want to get money. I want to get money all the time. So some choices went well, some choices didn't. So the mindset that I got from that is when I stopped judging him, <laughs> because at the beginning I thought, how could you be in that space and not thinking about my, my mother and the family? But because he's one of these risk takers that mm -hmm. he's willing to throw everything in regardless of everything. But when I was able to sit back and look at him long enough, I realized that I could be generative and willing to create more, but with a little bit more conscious and aware, mm -hmm. not just go in there just to get money, but go in and create things that will create something even greater. Can you see the difference between the two? Because mm -hmm. I knew that my father is all about getting money. My father is all about if something bright and shiny come on and someone said, you know, you can... Uh, build the something else he'll build the empire so he's he always built something huge and large but um wow that is space he showed me that mm. you know he would do it but for me I, what i learned from him is that you can still be willing to go out there and be willing to create greater possibilities if you could actually be in the question about it and not just throw everything in without looking at what would your choice create. He created a space for me to see that he never actually looked at what the choices would create, mm -hmm. which allowed me to see that, okay, before I make the choice to do anything, 
I would tap into my awareness. I would be in the question, okay, what would this choice create for me and everyone concerned for now and in the future? And if it feels expansive and if it feels like it's going to create greater possibilities, then I would do it. But if it's starting to feel wonky and feels like it's going to create less possibilities and going to create upheaval for everyone concerned, then I would look for other choices. So I'm very grateful that he had uh, that tenacity and the willingness to go after whatever it is that gave me the space to know that you can have that. But at the same time, if you make money significant and greater than you, downfall could happen. But if you make create, uh, create greater possibilities for everyone concerned and create more for the world as a priority, greater possibilities can get created. Wow. And what about your mom? Tell me a little bit about her. How did, what was her thoughts around money? My mother has such a generosity of spirit. I think that's one thing that I got from her. Even when my father created the space for us to lose all the money, she was still in the space of generosity of spirit. She didn't judge him. um, And she was in total allowance of him. I think she, even though she had not much money, but she willing to help anyone Mm. with money. So I sense that, She's never had the sense of lack in herself, even though there's a lot of lack in the outside world during the time that my father's project didn't do too well. Whereabouts did you grow up? I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand until I was 13. Mm -hmm. And then I came to Melbourne, Australia at 13. Okay. So yeah, it's, that's interesting. I can so see both traits that you've, that you have, which the creativity, but also just the, I'm going to do this, but having that conscious awareness now is, I can totally see where you get that from. That's fantastic to know that. Well, thank you for asking me that question, those questions, because no one ever did. And I never talked to anyone about it. So this is probably the first time in 50 years to actually look at and actually seeing both of my parents for who they really were. And now I could actually see that, you know, everywhere that I might have had a judgment about my father being what he was, I could see that, okay, I took the good aspect of his trade I took the really good aspect of my mother's trait, which is, you know, a lot about everything. And and once I stopped judging that my father is just so out there and never, never, you know, see the consequence, then I know that I can't go be out there and actually be more following the energy and be the question about what this choice is going to create that will allow me to be even more. So I think this conversation even changed the energy that would allow me to be able to create more in my life. Thanks for that. Mm, You're welcome. And just, I love what you, how you share about the learnings from your parents too. And I just, just also the balance between one and the other brings balance because one is doing one thing and one's the other, just them together is is a total balance which is where what you picked up which is incredible so how long did it take you to create a a million dollar i guess milestone in your business when steve and i set up our business uh, 17 years ago we had three priorities so the top the first priority is to be the catalyst for change and for different possibilities in the world so the first one's not about money it's not about You know, most people want to set up the business because they just want to create money with the business. So for us, the first priority is to be the catalyst for people to see that there are different ways of doing business. There are different ways of being a leader in the world and there are different ways of making money and profit. They have to be together to to be successful. And the second priority for us is we, we want to create the lifestyle and the lifestyle choice. 
that would allow us to travel the world and make really good living for ourselves. So that's the second priority. Because for what reason would you have a business if you don't make any money at all? You become no profit, Life. not even non profit. Yeah. And the third one was I was totally have a deliberate choice to want to set the business up so that I can actually build wealth through the business. Mm -hmm. So that's different mindset as well, that not just, not just create the business and take the money to invest somewhere else. I want to create the whole system and structure. I knew that's possible, but no one actually talked about it and did it during those times. And I said to Steve, what would it be like if we could just set the business and the whole business also have multiple stream of possibilities, not just one, because most people tend to set up a business and do one thing. And I said, between the two of us, we have so many skills and so many ideas and so many possibilities. So what if the business could generate and create multiple stream of possibilities? Notice I'm not saying, multiple stream of money and income possibilities first because the more possibilities you create it's always lead to more money anyway because we believe that if we expand our life we expand the world we be in contribution to create something even greater in the world the money will come and we truly believe that and did you understand the universal laws of when you be of more of service or you are the law of reciprocity when it comes back? Did you understand those laws at all when you were developing the business as well? Well, I have been a seeker all my life. I've uh, been through, you know, every form of meditation, spiritual practice, you name it, I've done it. And um and I also got a master's degree in psychotherapy, transpersonal change facilitator, which is all about that, about transpersonal, about you are the creator source of your own reality. And if you, uh, you know, that the universe will provide, if you totally trust and you're totally able to be in communion with the universe, I don't talk about it in the business space as much, uh, but Why? that's how Steve and I choose to be. So mm. we totally believe that we are the creator source of our reality in our life. Do you think the businesses are ready to hear that conversation though? Because that's what you, you guys teach when you travel, isn't it? That, that coming from that place? Mm. We do have multiple businesses. We have one, it's super mainstream, where you know the CEO of the top level, where they just, don't want to know about spiritual, where the board are in conflict with one another and our job is going in to show them that there are different ways to work together, different ways to communicate with awareness and consciousness. So when people are ready to hear, even in that space, we talk about it. But we also uh, wrote a book on prosperity consciousness and co being a conscious leader in our own life, which... There's another market for us that we have followed of our books that we didn't know, Prosperity Consciousness. It has been translated into French. Mm -hmm. We didn't, you know, someone mm -hmm. asked us, can I translate into French? We said, oh, sure. But we didn't realize that it's got so big in French that people wow. were doing book club and things like that. So once we realized that, oh, we are actually have a lot of people wanting to know about what it would be like to bring consciousness into money and into creating life, then we're starting to create workshop. But we only did that because there was a demand, you know, people asking us to become a speaker at their event and they invited us to come and speak at their, you know, book club that they did uh, on prosperity, consciousness and things. So that's how it became a business in itself that wasn't the one that we we set out to do so so we now travel the world talking about demystifying the myth of prosperity consciousness so when you guys like how long did it take you to go from okay this is where we are to creating a million dollar business pretty quickly really we didn't we didn't think it would have gone that fast because uh because people knew us already. We didn't really have to 
to promote. We didn't do marketing or advertising because we've been in this business world for over 20 years. So people knew Steve from being the CEO of Institute of Banking and Finance and Corporate Treasure. So uh, he started talking at all of the conferences. We got invited to, to speak. So we started talking about strategic awareness and, and all these sort of things. So before we knew it, uh, we, we get a lot of people asking us to come in and, and consult with the boards, to work with the boards. And we end up becoming the advisor to the CEO because, you know, there's a lot of situation when, where the CEO and the board are not working in harmony. And a lot of the time, CEO don't have anyone to talk to. You know, it's a, it's a very lonely space up there if they don't have someone to talk to. So that became a space for us when they found out that, oh, Steve and Chutis are there. I can actually come and sit in their backyard and share what's going on. So that became another uh, service, another project so quickly for us. And the funny thing is, you know, in consultancy business, because our business called Conscious Governance, the first one. We were a consultant. And for most people in this reality, in this world, the consultants have to pitch for the job. Mm -hmm. So someone will put out the, the job saying, I want strategic planning, I want risk management, I want board training. Then the consultant will have to pitch for the job. And then you have to sit back on waiting to get called whether you know whether they want to choose us or not and i just i said to steve that this way of working doesn't work either you know i don't want to be a chosen one can you can you feel sitting there waiting someone to actually choose to to use you or not so i i, I completely I relate to that <laughs> i said to steve what would it be like steve if we are the choosing one, what would it be like if we are the one that, you know, people come and pitch to us and say, Steve Chutisa, I would really love you to come and advise us. So, you know, it's like, what would it be like if the client actually begging for us to work with them? So I just posted that. And as you see that, when you ask the question, you ask the universe, even though, you know, you might just not seriously asking because in that moment, no one else doing that. So I just posted that to, the, to Steve. And Steve said, we can play with that. So yeah. I started off, we, instead of um, all the pitching, the paper that we have to submit to all of the job, we just say, Steve changed the word into in, invitation to work with us. So it just shifted the energy already. Instead of, please, please choose us. Please, please choose us. We shift the energy saying, hey, this is what we could do. We are totally different. What we do, it's not the same as everyone else. But if you would like to work with us, we're here. So let us know. So we made the energy of our business into we are a choosing one. So if you could see the, the energy between being a choosing one and the chosen one, we are the one who choose who we want to work with. We are the one who choose instead of sitting there waiting for people to choose us. You're the creator. You are bringing in, and it's a belief that you've shifted by the sound of it. So you really shifted an idea or a belief. So then you were open to that possibility and you focused on that. I love Absolutely. that. Fantastic. And it works. Like within less than a year now, we asked me whether how fast our business grew. Less than a year, people are starting to know us. And, you know, the, the thing about working with the board is we actually, people who are on the boards actually working for many multiple organizations, not just that one. So they, they come and be the board director, but they're also on many other boards. So the space that we were being create the energy and space that create curiosity for people and create the space for people to see, oh, these guys are really different. So they introduced us to another board, another board. So we never really had to do any promotion or advertising. We're just being 
uh, invited to go to work with another board, another CEO, another group. So we just get the phone call and say, so and so from this board, you know, recommended you. So if you made a deliberate choice to want to create your life that way, everyone can do it. We just show that we, we have done it because we believe, oh, at first we didn't know that's possible, but we just say, what if it could be? What if it could be? And that's just the, the question that we posted. And the universe said, yes, it could be. So here it is. So it is possible. Just on that, I really love that point that you made because in marketing, 101 of marketing, when an area is crowded, you look for other ways that you can do things completely opposite to what you, to what you expect or what is being done. And that's where you take yourself away from all social media and start listening to your own voice of what's possible and not worry about whether it's being done or not or if other people say no. You just follow that inner guidance and just go for it. I think we still can do social media if we could do it from space of being a chosen one, not the chosen one. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we're not doing, you know how a lot of social media just looking for having more followers and that's from the space of lack yes. you know how often you go in oh i want i need more follower for what reason you know if you just have it for the sake of the what would they call ego uh what's the word there's a word for that uh, the uh, ego versus or oh, there's eco versus ego the you're talking about well it's showing up and making a difference coming from possibility rather than desperation Exactly. You know, a lot of people are trying to post on social media from desperation. So if we all can actually shift from a space of desperation to the space of contribution, you know, like that's why I am uh, now uh, at the beginning when I start doing the YouTube, I had different energy about my YouTube channel because I just bought into <laughs> how everyone else is doing it. But then slowly, slowly I thought, oh, you know, if I don't actually do the same as everyone else, what would I choose? And what if I'm just doing it for the space of contribution, for the space of fun for me and for a space of, you know, I don't, really have to Legacy. have millions of uh, followers. But when I drop that though, my follower just increased hugely. You know, I, yeah. the, the more, I think I could tell you the moment that I just dropped from the space, or, oh, I need to have more subscribers. I know, I remember that. I need to have that, you know. Remember I said to you, hey, Rachel, I need more subscriber. And I yeah. thought, why do I need subscriber? Am I doing this for me, for fun? Whatever I'm doing, would this create contribution for some people? Then, you know, let's have fun. And I, I start that. doing it from different energy. The YouTube, shifting and changing a little bit, but I still have a lot more to learn from you, Rachel, but uh, in terms of making it a more quality product, not, not, the, not anything else because I know there's so much more that I can make in terms of B-rolls and things to make it better. But the energy of why I'm doing it has mm. shifted, has changed. And I love that. I did that. I had three more, 300 more subscribers just like that. So, And, and I love that with energy because we talk about video is an energy. And when you can just, when, when you have an intention attached to the energy, then it's going to follow you or it's going to follow that intention. And when you let it go, I love that because we talk about that in our workshop so much. It's just, it's just like when something doesn't work on your computer or your microphone or your phone blocks up or something happens when you're stressed. It's exactly the same. Yeah, and you um, said a number of times too that be aware of the energy that you have while you're making the video and that's exactly what Steve and I uh, uh, look at and talk about to people, even to the board who's so mainstream, so, uh, so you know, form structure and significant. We often invite them to, if they could receive, you know, if we know that they're not going to receive and they're going to throw a tomato at us, if we say that, then we, we just have to follow the energy and know what can people receive. And we just said, you know, just perceive the energy in this board right now. Mm. You know, there's so many upheavals, so many conflicts. So what sort of energy are you creating for this business? You know, and if the business is not doing so well, 
you as a board, you director as a board, are responsible for creating that energy for the business. Mm. So for the business to change, the board need to be willing to be and do something totally different to change the energy. And those boards who can receive it, love it. And mm. the one that we know that couldn't receive it, we don't say it, but we just be that energy. Because, you know, like when you go into the board meeting, quite often, they're always, quite often, 99% of the time, there's a lot of conflict of interest and all those sort of things. And we get caught in to be, uh, you know, facilitate the board, um, board work or anything like that. We, both of us, made the choice to be the catalyst the energy that could actually walk in through the boardroom and create different space for people to actually have a space to look at different possibilities. And, and that was the deliberate choice for us to be that as well, because, you know, we all, you know, when you walk into a party or a room that mm -hmm. people have conflict, quite often we buy into that conflict and just get, you know, a draw. Like toilet paper conflict. right now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, so when, when we're not drawn into the conflict or not drawn to the energy that people are creating, but at the same time, not resist and react. <laughs> so when we are the consultant, we, are, we can actually be that because we are consultant. We, we're there as the more neutral mm -hmm. to actually see the energy that's happening without resisting and reacting into the energy. But sometimes in our everyday life, when our loved one doing some crazy stuff, it's easy to be drawn into that energy. Yes. You have to be able to step out and say, hey, you know, what <laughs> energy can I be that would change the, the craziness around here? So quite quickly, you grew to a million dollar business. So if somebody was to, is watching this right now and they are at a hundred thousand dollar business and they're wanting to create a million dollar business, what would be the steps or how many steps or what's the pathway that you'd suggest to take to create a million dollar business? I think the key thing is if you're just a small business or you're just solo uh, entrepreneur and if you want to grow into, you know, sustainable multi-million dollars business, first you have to look at the structure of the, your business. You know, is your ha do you have a business that have the structure that would allow you to grow and expand to be multi-million dollars business? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you know, that's the first thing that you have to look at of what you can do to create that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's important. So when Steve and I set up our business, we knew then that we don't want to create confined small business. We knew that we wanted to create business that will grow, expand, and be more. So we created the, the corporation structure that would allow us to add more and more into business, into that structure. So I built, we built the structure of business up top and then would allow us to, to create multiple businesses underneath that. And so do you have CEOs and people that are responsible? So they're leading and you're now overseeing everything or you're still the main people to be contacted? In Australia, we have conscious governance where we add a lot more consultants, a lot more people that go out and connect that with clients and things as well. We have the uh, office manager where everyone connect with her. And when we travel, she's the one that, coordinate and do everything there. So that's for conscious governance business. We also, underneath that, we also have information um, content creation business where we do publish uh, books and publish ebook and publish all the content that the board and people can use. And, you know, we, we use Kajabi where people can sign up. We do things that are doing so well called induction program for the boards because boards have uh, to put new board director on. And when they put new director on, they have to have induction program. Mm -hmm. So we create those sort of really content that people can just sign up and sign their board up to use. So, so that's the second business, uh, information uh, 
provider. We have things like MP3 where people can download the things on Kajabi's. People can use ebook, audio books, and all those things. So that's another business that has its own uh, structure that come under um, conscious governance. And and then we set up the business as well that it's a business of wealth creation, which mm-hmm. is part of the this business because. If you want to create wealth creation, the wealth creation, it would be more expensive to create wealth creation as a business, business of wealth creation instead of doing business and take money and trying to invest in something. Mm -hmm. So if you can integrate your wealth creation as part of the business, so that's what we did. Mm -hmm. We create the wealth creation business that uh, invests in, you know, property, oversee, Mm -hmm. Uh, invest in, you know, like property in U.S., in Castle, in Italy, you know, um, all the uh, share investment of the trading, of the investment, go under Mm -hmm. invest, you know, the business of uh, wealth creation. And then uh, we have the antique jewelry business. That one grew into become a business because we actually, I, I love antique jewelry. And what I like about it is, I, I just don't like the way old stuff get destroyed. Mm. What created was when I was in, in, in Paris and this beautiful gold chain, you know, the Paris has mm. these ornate chains and things. In, really in speak as gold. well. Mm. And if, uh, if they put it out, they often get destroyed, like melt. And I thought, that is very sad. You know, you're not going to see that get created ever again. So I started going around collecting, buying all those beautiful gold chains in Europe, in, in Paris. And that's how it started. Are they thick um, gold chains? Are they really thick? They're gold? all variety, really. Uh-huh. They're very on. They're, they're not chain itself. They've got really nice design. Next time I see you, I, I show them to you. Uh-huh. They're really, some of them are just so beautiful design that, um, that they're very specially French gold chain, and they're very rare now. They're very hard to find because people melted them all. They melt them all and they pour them into pawnbrokers to get money for gold. And Absolutely. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Wow. And I mm-hmm. just, whenever I see them, I buy them. So that's how it started. Uh, our jewelry business is trying to create sustainability for all beautiful stuff. And that became investment because mm-hmm. that's part of our investment as well, the, the jewelry, antique jewelry business. And then we thought, oh, we travel the world a lot and mm-hmm. we go into all these places that have auctions, an auctions house that auction out all antique jewelry that we don't have in Australia. You know, in UK, uh, they auction things that are so much older than Australia. So... We look at when we travel and see who's having any auction house having um, antique jewelry auction. Then we go and have a look, and if anything we like, then we we buy it, and then it's become a business as part mm. of uh, we we selling all of our uh, beautiful antique jewelry at Antique Guild in in Brisbane. So that's also another way that you can generate more streams. You look at what you're passionate about. You love jewelry. And you just saw that when you were traveling that there was a real, again, looking for that need or that gap in the market. You're very switched on to what's missing and where things are going, but also your values, what your values are come really strong through all of the things that you've mentioned about sustainability, about making a difference, uh, creativity, helping people to be better in any way. So it's, it's, I can see your values really clearly through all of that. It's really powerful. Thank you. So what step, how many steps would you say just in an outline of hundred K to a million dollars? What are the exact steps you take? Some step is a mindset step and some step is the, the, mm-hmm. the actual doing step. So the first one is set up this system and structure that allow you to grow and expand and, and have that. But number two that I find most people don't have is they want to have a multi-million dollars business, but at the same time, they don't believe that's possible. So 
The second step before you even go anywhere else is we have to be willing to look at, do we believe that we have capacity and ability to really, truly build the multi-million dollars business, not just one million, because the first million is probably the hardest. So we have to be willing to create multi-million dollars business. And that second step is you have to be willing to work on your mindset. If your mindset say it's not possible, then it's never going to be possible. You can give them 101 things to do. They would never create it because people would just sabotage themselves mm -hmm. because whatever. And the third thing we always talk to people is, so the mindset is important. If you don't believe that it's possible, you would never choose to make it possible. And the third key is to look at if you only make $100,000 right now, what point of view do you have or what points of view do you have that keep you trapped in that $100,000? Because beside the points of view, what else that you are creating that maintaining that level? So you have to be in the question about it, that if I want to create more than $100,000, if I keep doing same, same things over and over again and trying to chase and trying to get more clients, is that all going to lead to a million dollars? Because, you know, a lot of time people go into fixed point of view to think that, oh, this is a great idea. This is something that we have and we can have a million dollars business by just chasing to have more clients. Mm -hmm. What if just keep doing the same, more of the same is not the thing that's going to lead you to greater possibilities. So um, I would invite people to start being in the generative moment of what else is possible and let go of the fixed point of view about how things are supposed to be. Because a lot of people we advise is that they say, but I, I have done all this marketing and I've been chasing client and I've been doing this. And we said, that's a problem, chasing client, you know, chasing them away or, are they, you know, that word in itself, I'm chasing mm -hmm. more money, I'm chasing client, become aware of the words that you're using. What are you oh. chasing? you know, the word that you're chasing someone and they're running away from you. So become aware of the words you use, the mindset that you are using and become aware, okay, of the things that allow me to create my business, $200,000 right now. If I do more of those, would this going to allow me to create a million dollars? This is the third step. And if it doesn't, you have to ask yourself, so what do I need to add to my business in my life that would allow me to create and generate more possibility right here and right now? So when I'm talking about the step, I don't talk about contextual reality, reality step because step for everyone is different step. Mm -hmm. Step for Steve and I is we constantly asking, what else can we add to our life that would be fun for us? You know, if it's not fun, we don't do it. So we don't actually have a formula that do this and do that and then you add. So our business keep on adding and, grow, adding and growing and we just keep following the energy, ask the question, if I choose to create this in my business, what would I create with this? We're constantly asking that question. So just going back to that, because something that you shared with me a little while ago that I thought was really interesting because a lot of a lot of people out there will say, okay, you goal set and you put down your goals and you've got your structure that you want to follow. But you do things a little differently when you guys get up in the morning, you ask this question. So do you plan your goals for the day or do you step into the energy? We normally follow the energy. That is very important to us because to us, goal often can come from a fixed point of view about how things are supposed to be. And sometimes when you hear people talking about goal, we tend to look at target, what target we would like to create because targets moving, you can move the target, but go often to fix from the fixed state of this is what I need to create. And very often our client, when, we, when they're talking about goal, that goal tend to come from conclusion, projection, mm -hmm. expectation, and judgment. Mm -hmm. Instead of from the space of, would this create more in my life? They come from the conclusion that 
Somebody told them that if they want to be successful, they have to do this, this, and that. And that it's not even their conclusion. They're buying someone else's conclusion and trying to secure it as their reality. So we often ask, okay, you're setting that goal. Is that your goal? Where did that you get that goal from? And is that going to create more in your life? If money is no object, if you already have everything you desire in life, would you still go with this goal? You know, what would you Love want to question. create? Mm-hmm. So we constantly be in the question, whether we were mm-hmm. we working with the board or we're working with individual people or we're working with the CEO, we always ask them questions to inspire them to know that they know. And we invite them to know that create your own reality. Don't buy someone else's reality. And that mm-hmm. is something that Steve and I constantly living ourselves up, buying someone else's reality. Yes, uh-huh. no. Oh, yes, we are. So what need to change here? You know, it's so often to buy someone else's reality because it's just so out there. And what I love about this series is that every single person that I'm interviewing has got a completely different reality. So this will inspire you, if you are looking, to look at what, what serves you, what inspires you, and so you can create your own reality from, based on what, what you love and what you're drawn to. I love that. Absolutely. And that's exactly what it is, Rachel. There's no, there's no fixed formula. It's something might work for someone else, then it, it might not work for you, for your business. So like you said, you, you, first is you have to be willing to be the creator source of your reality. I try it out. If you want to set go and then if it doesn't work, you know, choose something else. For us, we don't find goals really work, but we follow the energy. Every morning, Steve and I will wake up because we have we have business in in Europe as well, which is at the moment is interesting. And we have we have the uh, what we call European coordinator in Europe who take care of those. So we always ask, so what require our attention our energy our focus right now and if i get yes i need to contact our global coordinator our european coordinator i will skype her and ring her Mm -hmm. and uh if i feel the sense that the jewelry business needs something then i would contact the um the manager of the antique guild so basically i would be in the question that I want to function at that level, not, you know, micromanage everything. Uh, Otherwise, I would call every single one of them. I'd love to understand what have been your three biggest challenges yourself or fears or things that you've really had to work through that you can share or mistakes that you've had to work through. Just what are three things that you've had to work through that would help somebody maybe be aware of something that may be stopping them? The first number one challenge for me was that when I was growing up, I was not allow myself to even educate myself about money and finance. And I didn't want to know anything about it. Even when I was working um, as a corporate executive, managing $35 million business, I was not taking care of our own personal finance. Mm-hmm. And uh, then one day, my, one of my mentors said, you know, what would it be like if you become the CFO of your own life? And thought, wow, never even thought of that. What would I have to be and do to be a CFO of my own life? Before that moment, we used to, you know, have a financial advisor, just gave him everything and just for him to invest. I didn't even put my attention or my awareness into what the financial advisor was doing with our money. And that moment I started asking, okay, this is a challenge. I had no clue about what it means to be a CFO of my own life, but it felt like fun and expansive and generative. So I made the deliberate choice right there and then to looking at what I needed to be and do different to be that. So it took me a while to educate myself about everything to do with money, to do with finance, to do with everything, because I knew that 
for me to really overcome that challenge, I have to become a master of money, a master of finance. And, and I, I was working and putting myself through all kind of education, you know, about anything that would allow me to know about finance. So that's number one. Number two was when I used to think that uh, my father is crazy risk taker. I became risk averse. So I, I didn't really want to take much risk unless it's you know, safe and secure and everything. So I went to the point, to the point that, uh, well, he's go out there and do everything crazy. I'm just not going to be as crazy as him. <laughs> and that was a limitation as well, because by judging that I'm not choosing to be reckless and be crazy and be that, it's created a limitation in what I could create. Because if I wanted to create our life as so safe, predictable and secure, we wouldn't do what we are doing right now. So that's the second challenge for me to overcome is to look at, you know, how can I still see and choose possibilities without being reckless, without being aware of what my choice would create. So that, that's, you know, took time for me to making the choice every day to actually know that I can function from possibilities and, and I have to shift the, the word of reckless because that was a judgment. He just, mm -hmm. he just liked to be, uh, uh, what you, what would you call the adrenaline a great Lord. entrepreneur without without caring and and mm. you know so that that was his I don't have to be like that so I made the choice to to actually be more in the question rather than mm. just doing it without concern of any consequences and the and third one the third one is to do with you as well Rachel thanks to you because the third one is. I've been doing all these things, I wrote book, doing all this, but I would refuse to actually speak in front of the camera. I never had the desire, or maybe I should say, I never thought that I could actually be <laughs> good in front of the camera. I didn't want to receive judgment from people. I obviously had a lot of judgment that I wasn't any good in front of the camera. So if I had that judgment myself, um, also think that other people would have judgment mm -hmm. about how I would be in front of the camera. So when I, when I met you probably seven months ago, eight months ago, I went to your class and I said to you, oh, I, I, I want, I really want to be a director, you know, making a lot of nice video, directing things. And that's, that still be fun for me. I still want to do that, just directing. And then you turn to me about, oh, what about you presenting? No, 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 no <laughs> that's not for me. And but look at you yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, and from that space, you know, from that space of you invited me to even consider of doing presenting as well as directing, it creates something different. It's only been six months, so, you know, I'm now feeling more comfortable in front of the camera. I could be even greater, I think. So yes, so from that space, now I, I'm overcoming the point of view that I cannot uh, be in front of camera, which in itself actually helped me to be willing to receive judgment and be willing to don't actually make anyone else's point of view bother me anymore, particularly if you want to be on Facebook. You know, I, the other thing, not that, Facebook, YouTube, but the other thing too, is that you are being, you are creating so many more possibilities and who you can serve multiplies tenfold when you can be on video because you don't know that somebody on the other side of the world that's never met you, you may have changed their life by watching you. And if you don't show up and do that, it's just, it's, it's contracting, isn't mm. it? Yeah, absolutely. I think. I'm not quite sure yet how many levels of shift and change changes actually created for me since I have made the choice to be willing to speak in front of the camera. You know, mm -hmm. it's so much easier now 
than before. And it's getting better more and more and more. But I'm, I'm stop judging myself. When I look at the video at the beginning, I thought, <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to edit all that out and you know, <laughs> put me roll on top. <laughs> but also, I love that it's energe- energetically when there's so many levels to showing up and being more. And I think that's what I love is there's the so many invisible ways that you can communicate. So well done. Cause I think I've just, we're so proud of what you have created. You're showing up on Facebook lives, your YouTube channel, you're doing more on video with your clients. So well done. Thank you. You know, I used to hate Facebook lives so much. Like just please don't make me do it <laughs> kind of energy. But now I'm really enjoy that being on Facebook Live. I love it. I love watching. It's fantastic. So do you have any wealth games or any fun little things that you can share with the audience? If somebody is wanting to expand their mindset around money, do you have anything fun that they could do? Well, if, if you ask me about what we, what we do, we just write books and tell people about what they can do. So we have a book called Prosperity Consciousness and we create the program that people can listen to uh, MP3 downloads of 60 seconds that they get once a week to listen and then they they, they have homework to do and things. So it's only 60 seconds long, but each week they get the 60 seconds and they get uh, targeted questions and homework and things that they can do. Do you have a little sneak one that you could share with me now? I don't have anything in front of me. I just, sorry, Laura Jo. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I was it's, just... called choice. it's called Choice for Wealth. Choice for Wealth program. So we're talking about, uh, yeah, it's, it's like it's, uh, each, each week it's 60 seconds and then they, they have to do something from it. But it's, uh, the whole theme is a Choice for Wealth to start off with. The reason why most people are not wealthy is because they not never make a deliberate choice to be wealthy. Mm. So, so that's the, 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 the first few sessions is about if you really want to be wealthy, if you want to be healthy, if you want to be happy, make a deliberate choice, you know, that I'm going to be wealthy. And then you can go into, so I am making a choice to be wealthy. Mm. Then what can I be into to allow me to be that? Because if you talk to most people, they just don't even make deliberate choice that to mm. be wealthy. And in That's fact, true. they don't even think that they could be wealthy. I think a lot of people do. And I guess because whatever their grandparents have grown up or in the war areas or they haven't been around that kind of uh, support or thinking when they were growing up. So everything is available to you right now. You can create anything that you want. We're in a time that it's just infinite potential and infinite possibilities, which I I love. And I think this is not a game as such, but it's a, it's a philosophy and a way of being that maybe we can make into the game. Maybe you and I can make this one to the game because Steve and I believe that, uh, truly believe that what if nothing is a problem and everything's possibilities, you know, um, as a industrial designer and ergonomist, I was so trained to be a good problem solver. Do you know, if there's no problem, we can find some problem that we could solve. That's the training that I have been to do. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, oh my goodness, that is, you know, that is one big mistake. I think you asked me one time, that is one big mistake that I have been doing that. I am a great problem solver. Give me a problem and I will solve. And I realized that, do you know what? What if nothing, absolutely nothing is a problem? But if you can see everything as possibilities, Mm. what could you choose to be, do, have, create, and generate? For example, if you think that everything is a problem, you will have to always find the problem so you can create possibilities. So maybe this could be a game, a game that if you want to uh, create million dollars business, if you would like to become, create more wealth than what you already have, what if you start looking at, what if nothing was a problem, you know, what would you choose? 
you know, oh, and anytime you jump into, game. oh, this is a problem, you can say, oh, what possibility creating here that we're not actually acknowledging. Mm. You know, a lot of time, every single problem you have is a possibility that we're not seeing. And especially so, today with everything going on in the world, with the, the virus out there, there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, but start thinking about what if everything isn't a problem. I love that. And if you could sit in that space and look at crazy people running around mm -hmm. uh, taking toilet roll off the shelf, and if you don't resist and react <laughs> and you go into what if this is not a problem what possibility i'm not seeing here you know that is a nice game and we were playing with that for a long time when anything that you know steve and i've been doing that for many many years when anything one of us come in and and say oh um whatever that's deemed to be a problem then one of us will say what if that's not a problem so what's possibilities that we're not acknowledging here. So that would That's be a, a good really game. good game for mm. everyone. So if you look at your cash flow and say, oh, I have a cash flow problem, you know, which everyone seems to be saying, particularly now when all the shops are closing and when all the, mm. you know, what if cash flow is not a problem? What possibilities could be creating with this? And what do you need to be and do now? to allow it not to be a problem. And what comes up for me when you say that right now is I can hear, because I've had similar conversations, is the, yeah, but it's all right, for, that yeah, but, or oh, I'd like to, but. And so that, because that already is creating a problem. As soon as you say that, if you say, yeah, but, or you're not coming from that anymore. And, and I love how Abraham Hicks will say that you create the awareness, you go after something that you want, but immediately the next thought is you cancel it out. And so Absolutely. you've already cancel out that possibility. So really come from a place of don't say the but. Yeah, I mean, if people could truly, truly perceive and receive that, that point of view actually create their reality. And as soon as you say, yes, but, you already told the universe that you don't really want it. And you don't believe it. You don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I think that is such a simple notion, isn't it? That whatever you believe is what you create. So yeah. if you say, yes, but, you don't believe that you could be a multimillionaire, mm -hmm. so you will create whatever opposite. Uh, if you say yes, but you could, you know, see everything as a possibilities. Mm -hmm. How could you do that? You just being what? What is the what is the TV show that they do? Um, the one that she's the little girl, the one that um, Pollyanna. Oh. <laughs> People tend to say, ah, oh, you're being a Pollyanna, you know, like, and that in itself is already say. Yes, but. Yeah, and I wanted to bring that up because I can just imagine people go, possibility, yeah, but. So that's really good. Love it. But you say the nice way. Most people say with more judgment energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> or the Aussie way. Yeah. <laughs> so as you know, Chatisa, we are all about crazy ideas and we call them crazy ideas because we love visionary, big big things that people go after in their, in their life, those ideas that they're not quite sure of how they're going to create as a reality, say like with the elephant idea for me. So w with the wealth you've created, how has that helped you to follow more create crazy ideas and what crazy ideas do you have now that you are implementing or that you want to create in the world? Crazy idea. Well, I would like, this is super crazy, I would like to create miracle that would change everyone who function from scarcity into being more prosperous. <laughs> so that is well, super crazy. <laughs> well, maybe what if it's possible? What if there isn't a problem and that is already the case? <laughs> what would it take for people to recognize and realize that, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, ideally is, you know, by just looking at this, for now, I'm, I'm sure this is not going to be evergreen if we're talking more about toilet paper. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, that is a space of scarcity, mm. you know. 
if people don't function from that space, there'll be wishing well for all. There'll be more of, you know, there's not a problem. There's plenty to go around and, you know, mm-hmm. what we can create from that. So that, that is just my desire to, to create the crazy idea. I want to create the documentary, actually, that, that um, be a series of small documentaries about living life from a space of prosperity and wealth, living life from a space of, you know, conscious living kind of uh, energy, but a, a small short film about what it means to function from that space. I love that. And I think one of the biggest words, when when you say conscious leadership, what keeps coming up for me in that is that people that are still battling with the day-to-day, they don't understand probably what even a conscious leader is or even that it exists and and let alone how to be one if they're not quite sure that it even exists. So the words that, that they're thinking is that survival of just... I'm on the treadmill. I know that I've got to pay my bills and I've got to do this. So it's breaking through that language barrier of, of what people are, what, what they're calling it. Yeah. People who actually, put it this way, people who's run, running around fighting over toilet paper are probably not going to be my audience because that's so such a big gap between where they are right now and to become a conscious leader in their own life. You know, it's, it's, it's just a big gap. But I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to keep on talking about it. I'm not going to try to force anyone to receive my point of view, but I'm going to create. Yeah, um, um, I'll talk to you further about what, how can we create a documentary that will be more inspirational for different level mm. of people, some people who's already that and wanting to choose more, and some people that who might spark just a little bit of possibilities mm. that if I stop being functioning, if I stop functioning in scarcity mindset, what else could I create in my life? What is yeah. the reason why I'm not having enough? What if the reason that I don't have enough money is because I buy the lie of scarcity? in this reality and what kind of world would it be how can you imagine the world if everybody thought like that absolutely absolutely and you know i know people will say Pollyanna, we should thinking <laughs> but i'm just will continue doing my part choosing to be a catalyst for people to see that there are different possibilities i only can create a space for people to see that there are different possibilities. You know, I love that quote that you can take the horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. So I'm just going to be that, you know, create the path for people to see. You lead from example. And that's all you can do is be that leader and keep talking about it and things change. I love that. Thanks to you. You gave me a platform to be able to create something. Now I know how. Well, thank you for being coachable and taking it on because you've got, you have only just started. (laughs) I love that. Thank you. I know how passionate you are about helping shift consciousness. Are there any other organizations or areas that you support, whether it be child trafficking, animal um, cruelty, um, children's education? Is there anything that you are really passionate about helping in the world? Well, Steve and I are working mainly in the uh, society changing organization. So that is our main consulting business. We will work with all of the society changing organization, like all of those. uh, Because you work with non-profits, right? So all of the non-profits you're supporting. Non-profit and what what they call society changing non-profit. Non-profit is just a tax status. And so when they call non-profit, are they the society changing organization that don't have to pay tax? Okay. So Steve and I, that is, that is our key priority because we know that we can work with, you know, all these organizations for them to be more generative, to be more sustainable, mm-hmm. that will allow them. So we work with the board to work out what else they can actually make their organization more, what else can I get more 
support from people. And mm -hmm. so we strategically work with people, strategically work with the board. So yes, we, we, are, we are supporting all of the society changing organization in the world. Fantastic. Well, that's what an amazing thing to be able to do, to be at that ground level that you can really influence change on the board level. So then you help the boards and then it filters through with that ripple effect through each organisation. Mm. We made that deliberate choice to mm. work at the board level, at the CEO of the board level, because, uh, you know, people tend to come and say, come and fix my staff, come and fix my organisation. We often say, you know, whatever get created right now, you are the board. You are the director of the board. You are the CEO. So how did you create that? Mm -hmm. You know, so we go into that space and say, if you would like to create something even greater, the board, the CEO will have to be the one who actually be the creator source of different possibilities mm -hmm. for the organization. So that is our main activities that we do a lot mm -hmm. when we don't do other workshop or masterclass and things. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Chatisa, for joining us today. I, you've shared so much knowledge and wisdom that there are so many little pieces of gold in what you've shared. So if people do want to contact you, how can they contact you or uh, get that little 60-second little snippet of wealth creation sent to them? What, how do they reach out to you? You could send to... Well, this one probably the easiest because I can access anywhere in the world. The two Bowmans at gmail.com and ask oh, for more that. information and then we'll send it to you. The two Bowmans. B O W M A N S mm -hmm. at gmail.com. We have that so we can actually access our, our, our email anywhere we are in the world. Fantastic. And I'll definitely put the address up for anybody that is wanting to reach out. Uh, and thank you so much for being here because, yeah, I could talk to you all day. You've got so much wisdom to share. So thank you for joining. You can look at my YouTube channel, though. Life Mastery Wisdom TV YouTube channel. You can you can connect with us there. And also write a comment if there's other things yes. you'd like to explore or uh, video subjects you'd like Chatisa to, to talk about, then definitely let her know. Yes, please. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You, Rachel. Bye. Ha!